You know, there are a lot of things about Earth that make it unique. And what I mean by that is that we've been trying to discover other planets and other places for as long as man has been around. And basically one of the things that we've not been able to find, in addition to life on other planets, is planets with the same makeup as Earth. Now, water is everywhere in our universe. But what's been interesting so far is we've not found another planet, at least up until the time I did this recording, this is June 2018, where we, where we found another planet that has large reserves of surface liquid water and water that exists in all three phases, liquid, solid, and gas in the atmosphere. So as you watch this video, I want you to really kind of clue in on some of the really cool things about water. In fact, that's one of the first bullet points to think about. Water is the only substance in the Earth's atmosphere that naturally exists in all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, when water is in its solid phase, it's actually not its most dense phase. You see, water is most dense when it is a liquid. That's why ice floats in a cup. And also, when we think about water on Earth, it is the great climate regulator. You see, water has a very, very high specific heat, which means it takes a lot of energy to change its temperature. And as a consequence, Earth's temperature is regulated by the enormous amount of water we have on our surface in the oceans. Now, when we think about those oceans, we know that 97% of all of the surface water that's on Earth, all of the surface water on Earth is in the oceans. And what's left over, that uh, about 3% or so, well, 2.4% of that is in glaciers, so it's locked up in ice, leaving just 0.6% of all the fresh water on Earth to be kind of tucked away there in fresh bodies of water, like the Great Lakes, like rivers and streams, the Mississippi, the Amazon, the Nile, these huge river systems. Turns out that only 0.001% of all of the water in the Earth, on Earth, is in the atmosphere. But still, that's 3.43 quadrillion gallons. Earth is definitely the saturated planet. Now, when we think about water and we think about its ability to change phase, I've got a couple of fun questions to ask you. Let's ask you this one first. If you were to take all the water out of the atmosphere and condense it into rain and have it fall to the ground, how deep would that water be when it reached the ground? In other words, if you make all the water that's in the atmosphere rain, how deep is the puddle? Now remember, we're spreading this out over the whole earth. So is it one inch deep? Is it 10 inches deep, 100 inches, 1,000 inches, or 10,000? You think about your answer. 3.43 quadrillion gallons. If that all rained out, how deep would it be? By the way, that's 3.43 times 10 to the 15. Got an answer? Turns out the correct answer is A, one inch. That's kind of amazing. That's a lot of water. But when you spread it out over across the surface of the earth, it's only an inch deep, which is why we should be very glad that we have a hydrologic cycle. In other words, that water evaporates and gets rained again and again and again. Now, when I tell you that, some of you might be thinking about this passage out of the Bible, Genesis chapter 7, where we're discussing the great flood uh, that Noah was in. Now, I want to let you know something interesting about water on earth. You see, surface water is not the largest reservoir of water on Earth. Turns out there is 10 times the amount of water that's in the Earth's oceans in the Earth's crust and mantle. Now, the only way that water gets out is through large volcanic events. But when you think about the way that Genesis chapter 7, especially verse 11, is written, it says, On that day, all of the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens opened. You see, we weren't only just getting rain from above. We were getting groundwater. We were getting water from Earth's crust and mantle on the day of that flood. Impressive just to think about how much water is in the Earth and atmosphere system. How about another question here? What do you think the world record holder is for the most rainfall in one hour? 6, 12, 24, 36, or 48 inches? That's a half a foot, one foot, two foot, three foot, or four foot. Well, it turns out the answer to that question is 12 inches. But it actually fell in 42 minutes. Holt, Missouri, 1966, one stationary thunderstorm, 12 inches of rain, continually fed with a bunch of Gulf of Mexico moisture. That is an incredible amount of rain. How about this one? Record holder for one day. Two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet. What do you think it is? Got your answer? Answer to this one? Six feet. 
there is an island called La Reunion. It holds the record for the 3-hour, 6-hour, 12-hour, 24-hour, which is 71.9 inches, 48-hour, 3-day, 4-day, 8-day, 9-day, 10-day, and 15-day rainfall records. It's right here off the coast of Madagascar, and it gets hit with major tropical cyclones, and that's why it gets such incredible rainfall amounts. But La Reunion, while it can be very, very wet there, doesn't hold a candle to our number one. What's the world record holder for the most rainfall in a year? 400 inches, 800 inches, 1,000, 1,500, or 2,000? What do you think? Well, that record was set in the foothills of the Himalayas in Cherrapunji, India, where in one year, August 1860 to July 1861, 1,042 inches of rain fell. Now, for perspective, Champagne's average annual rainfall is 40 inches of, of, of rain a year. So they got another thousand inches of rain. And you want something crazy? It's driven by the monsoon. And what that means is the Indian monsoon really only rains on India and Bangladesh about three months out of the year. So they got that rain basically in three months. Incredible to think about this. Okay, we're talking about moisture in the atmosphere, and I make one thing very, very clear. Check out these three images. I got a picture on the left where this guy is basically very hot and sweaty, but he's in a cold atmosphere, and therefore we can see all the steam rising above his head. Got a picture of a dog breathing on a cold fall day, and I have the back end of a Mustang here with dual exhaust, and you can see some, well, smoke coming out of the back of it. What is all of this? You might be tempted to call this water vapor, but it is not. Water vapor is a gas and our eyes can't see gases. Water vapor is invisible to our eyes. I mean, for example, I'm sitting here lecturing to my computer right now, and as I breathe, I'm putting out enormous amounts of water vapor. I don't see any of it though. In fact, a couple of semesters ago, I did marathon teaching every Tuesday and Thursday, where I teach from 11 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night, and I wouldn't really get much of a break to eat or drink anything. By the end of the day, my weight loss, just primarily from sweating and breathing, was some days over seven pounds. You see, we have a lot of water coming in and out of our bodies at any given time. Now, what are you seeing? Well, when you look at the, the water coming out of the dog's mouth or off the guy's head or out of the back of the exhaust of this Mustang, that is all condensed liquid water. Those are tiny little droplets of water. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You see, water, when we think about it in the atmosphere, naturally exists in all three phases. So you've got very easily here the liquid phase and the ice phase, which we can see without any trouble at all. But what I want you to be thinking about is that picture that's in the top there. See that one? You got that hot uh, kind of cup of, of coffee there. My good friend Ben was drinking that coffee, and I caught a picture of the sunlight coming through it. And it's just a great way to show you that what you're actually looking at there is a bunch of very, very tiny condensed little droplets of water. You see, that is liquid. That is not, that is not water vapor. So steam is liquid water. All right, keep that in mind as we walk through this lecture. Now, we're gonna talk about the particulars of water here in a few moments, but just remember, all three phases in Earth's atmosphere. Let's talk about the phase change of water. Here's a cool picture. This particular picture actually shows you, uh, well, it shows you two of the phases because we can't see the third. But look at this. When we look at the molecular structure of an ice crystal, it basically lines itself such that the hydrogen bonds that are created create six-sided ice crystals. So at the molecular level, ice is generally six sides like you see here. Now, why does ice float in liquid water? Well, that's because liquid water, what you have instead of getting permanent hydrogen bonds like you see over here, you have hydrogen bonds that are being constantly made and broken. So they're made, broken, made, broken, made, broken, and therefore you can compact more water molecules into the same space. See the free space here versus the space there. Now, what you're seeing up here, again, is condensed liquid water droplets. You don't see water vapor. Why? Because we can't see water vapor. So don't forget that. Now, when we talk about the phase change of water, the key term to discuss here is this thing called latent heat. You see, it energy is either required or released to change the phase of water. So let's look at the diagram on the bottom. You probably know these things pretty well, but let's just make sure that we got it all down. I got a picture of some ice over here. This is my favorite kind of ice. I love the little tiny ice chunks that you can get like Chick-fil-A. That's my favorite ice, okay? You can chew on that stuff all day. Ice here liquid water there, and I can't show you a picture of water vapor, the gas phase, because it doesn't exist. So I just put a circle over here. Now, you know that as you go between liquid water and ice, we call it melting and freezing. When we go between liquid water and gas, it's called evaporation and condensation. Maybe some of you remember that if you go from a solid 
to a gas, that's called sublimation. And you go from a gas to a solid, that's called deposition. Okay, that's just a little bit of review from when you were younger and you learned about this in grade school. Here's the take home point. I'm gonna draw a line right through the middle of this. All of the processes on the top line, going from the lower energy state, which is ice, to the higher energy states, which is liquid and gas, energy, heat is required. You know, if you wanna get an ice cube to melt, put it in your hand, warm it up with your hand and it'll melt. Going the other direction, that same amount of heat is released. So this is important because the amount of heat that's released is enormous as water goes from its lowest energy state, which is ice, to its highest energy state, which is water. We call the phase change, the energy that's used in the phase change, latent heat. Now, just to kind of give you an example here, if I put a pot of water on the stove and it had one gallon of water in it, and I basically boiled all that water away so that that water is now water vapor floating around in my kitchen, if I, in an instant, caused all of that water vapor to condense back into the pot, in an instant, it'd blow my entire house apart. Because in every single gallon of water, there is around four and a half sticks of dynamite worth of energy just in their molecular bonds. You see, when we break apart water and make it of gas, when we combine it together to make a liquid or a solid, a lot of energy is released or required. Now watch this video. This is a very pivotal moment in world history. That large bomber just dropped that bomb on Hiroshima in Japan. Now in physics, we often find that the ways that we try to understand large quantities of energies, we compare them to either the Hiroshima bomb on August 6, 1945, or the second one. This is the Nagasaki bomb. Turns out that this bomb you see here has a much, much bigger role to play in the history of weather, which I'll tell you about when we get to tornadoes later on in the semester. But the Fat Man bomb was a 20 kiloton bomb. Now, why talk about it? Well, this is Katrina at category five intensity. This is an image from our uh, low earth orbiting satellite, our polar orbiting satellite called MODIS. In Hurricane Katrina's eye wall, the pressure dropped down to below 900 millibars. And right around the eye, uh, the eye in the eye wall here, we had 175 mile an hour winds. And Katrina was basically a day and a half away from destroying New Orleans. Now, I don't want to talk about Hurricane Katrina's waves or wind or even rain. If you look at the total amount of energy that is in the cloud field of Hurricane Katrina, that's water vapor that condensed to make the clouds. That's water vapor that was evaporated off of the ocean surface. That's water vapor that used the energy of the sun to evaporate, okay? There are 600,000 fat man bombs worth of energy in the entirety of Hurricane Katrina's cloud field alone. Now, why doesn't it blow the earth apart? Because it's released slowly over a huge area. That's not like a nuclear weapon. But that just shows you how important this phase change is. Now, check out this animation put together by NASA. You are looking at an animation showing you globally how water vapor moves. Where you, what you can see is that near the equator, which runs right down the middle of the map, you have the highest concentration of water vapor. We'll talk about why in just a few moments. But what I want you to see is a couple of neat things. Here's South America. You see this region right in through here? This is the driest place on Earth outside of the Arctic and Antarctic. It's called the Atacama Desert. And the Atacama Desert... Well, there are some places in that desert where we have not ever measured precipitation since humans have been around trying to measure it. We think there are some riverbeds there that have been dry for 120,000 years. In fact, there was a flooding event. We're going to talk about this again later with our flood lectures. There was a flooding event a couple of years ago in a little town called Erica that is in the Atacama Desert here in Chile. They received nine years worth of rainfall in one afternoon from one thunderstorm. How much did they get? Nine-tenths of an inch. If it rained nine-tenths of an inch right now in Champaign-Urbana, it wouldn't matter at all. We get a couple of puddles. But this animation is showing you how water vapor is distributed throughout the atmosphere. You can see North America. We're here, silhouetted, drier out west. You can see uh, the Himalayas. The moisture flows right like this over India and Bangladesh, goes over the Himalayan mountains, and it's very dry in this plateau on the backside. You see, this is water vapor moving throughout the atmosphere. We can see it because we're looking at it with a very special satellite here. All right. Speaking of water vapor, is anybody having a bad hair day today? Well, some of you might have a bad hair day depending on how humid it is outside. Let me introduce you to Shrek. 
Shrek was a sheep that was lost for six years. And over those six years, Shrek never had its wool cut off of it. It was never sh shorn. And during that time, look at the massive amount of wool that it accumulated. You see, this sheep, after six years, had 90 additional pounds of wool. In fact, the wool had grown over its eyes. It could barely even see. 90 pounds of wool, by the way, is enough to make over 20 men's suits. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, the reason why I bring this up is because in my office right now, I have, an, I have a hair hygrometer. And hair hygrometry comes to us, by the way, of a guy named Nicholas de Cusa. Now, Nicholas had sheep like Shrek. Now, why did this matter? Well, it turns out that Nicholas learned that it was always wiser to sell his wool in the open market on days that it was raining or days that it was high humidity. And that's because wool, just like most people's hair, absorbs water vapor and therefore has greater mass. And so he would sell his wool on high humidity days because he could get more money for it. All right, same principle at play here. Underneath this lever over here, let me show it to you a little bit better. There is hair, human hair, from the 1940s strung between this clip and these two clips on either side. And it's held in place by a small weight that's keeping tension on it. Now, it turns out that as that hair absorbs water vapor, it lengthens. And as it lengthens, it allows the weight to pull down harder and this marker to go up on this rotating cylinder. Basically, we're using human hair as a proxy measurement for the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. Now, an interesting side effect of this is that a lot of hair, especially people with long hair, their hair will curl in addition to getting longer. If, you ever, if you're long hair and you're watching this, if you've ever gone to the barber shop or to a salon and had your hair cut, notice how they sometimes wash it first and they cut it? Well, when they dry it, do you notice how it shrinks? Well, that's the principle at play here. Now, why do we have to do this? We have to do this because we can't measure water vapor directly in the atmosphere. I can't count up the water molecules. I can't even see them for crying out loud. So I have to look at how water changes the behavior of things in order to measure it. You see, ultimately what I want is this quantity called the vapor pressure. We learned in our pressure lectures that air pressure is the force supplied by the air against a surface. Now, what's air made up of? Oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, argon, all those gases. What I really want to know is this. You see, the total air pressure is found by summing up all the individual partial pressures. That's Dalton's law. Most of our Earth's pressure is contributed by oxygen, nitrogen, and argon. But I want to know this. You see, there's the oxygen and nitrogen, the red dots in this particular cylinder. This is the water vapor. I'd like to know exactly how much of that there is. Because if that water vapor converts to, um, well, liquid, or solid, enormous amounts of heat are released. Remember, we just talked about this with Hurricane Katrina. But I can't get it, because ultimately, I've got all of it mixed together. It'd be like me asking you to stand on a scale and measure your weight just of your spleen. You realize you'd have to pull it out to get that, and then, of course, you would be really, really sick or possibly die. It's impossible. Or it's like putting an entire bowl of, of M&Ms with all different colors onto a scale and say, you know what, scale, just measure the brown ones. You can't separate them. So what we have to do is we have to figure out other ways by which we can measure the quantity of water vapor in the atmosphere. And the term we're going to go after here is vapor pressure. Now, you know what air pressure is? Well, vapor pressure is just the force per unit area applied by the water vapor molecules only. All right? It's only the water vapor molecules. So if in that cylinder, the total air pressure is 1,015 millibars, well, 1,000 of those millibars came from the dry air and 15 came from the water vapor. I want to know how to get that number 15. Well, to do that, I got to do a proxy measurement. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure something called the dew point temperature, because the dew point temperature is something I can physically measure, and it is directly related with a simple equation to vapor pressure. So we're going to come back to that term dew point in just a few moments. Now, I performed an experiment in my office a few years ago to kind of prove how powerful vapor pressure is. So I have a burner here, and on top of it, I have a uh, basically a tall bottle uh, here, or tall can here of Arizona sweet tea, but all the tea's gone, and I filled it just a little bit in the bottom with some water. I have off to the side here a, uh, a container full of some cool water. Watch what happens. You can hear it boiling. 
I'm going to flip it over into that container. Ready? Now that was pretty amazing. In just a few moments, that can completely crushed in on itself. Look at this. And in fact, it even pulled in a whole bunch of water. Now, why in the world did that happen? Let me take it back to the beginning. You see, at this point, I'm boiling a little bit of water in the bottom. And as it boils, it's filling the container full of water vapor, pushing out the oxygen, pushing out the nitrogen, basically making it about 100% full of water vapor. I then take the thing, flip it over, and toss it into the cool water. When I do that, I rapidly cool the sides of the can. Now, the water vapor that's in there rapidly condenses into liquid water. Therefore, it's no longer pushing against the sides of the can. Therefore, there's no internal pressure. The external pressure crushes it at nearly 15 pounds per square inch. And as it does so, it produces a pretty violent implosion. You just saw it right there. That shows you the partial pressure of water vapor that it exists. Okay, to get the rest of this down before we start to understand these two terms that are quite important, dew point temperature and relative humidity. I'm going to tell you a quick story from when I was in high school, freshman year, favorite teacher in the whole wide world. His name was Mr. Butcher, phenomenal science teacher. He is why I'm a scientist today. Well, in the in ninth grade, I was a punk little boy and I was sitting there in, in this lab class. Mr. Butcher gave us some sugar. He gave us a, 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 a like a beaker full of water, a little cylinder full of water, a Bunsen burner and a spoon. So start shoveling sugar in. So I did started shoveling sugar in. The goal was to get the sugar to dissolve. Oh, I could do it pretty easily. One spoonful in, dissolve. Two spoonfuls in, dissolve. Third spoon, food, uh, spoonful in, didn't dissolve. The sugar stayed a solid and went to the bottom of the, of the cylinder. He says, well, Eric, how are you going to get that to dissolve? I said, well, watch this. And I started trying to stir really, really fast. Didn't do a thing. He says, Eric, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. Can I add more water? He says, nope, no more water to be added. What are you going to do? Now, at this point, I had no idea. My lab partner, Marla, good friend of mine, says, Eric, Butcher also gave us a Bunsen burner. I said, oh, let's heat it up. I put the solution onto the Bunsen burner and got it real hot. I could put spoonful after spoonful after spoonful of sugar in and it would keep dissolving. Now, you probably know the end of the experiment, right? What we do is we put a string in it, let it cool down overnight, and the next day we had rock candy. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, you notice that I had to get the water hotter and hotter to hold more dissolved sugar. The atmosphere is the same way. You see, the amount of water vapor that can be contained in the atmosphere is directly related to its temperature. The hotter you make the atmosphere, the more water vapor it can contain. Not that it will contain it, but it can contain. You see, the graph that's down there in the bottom left shows you that as temperature increases, see this? The amount of water vapor the atmosphere can contain increases exponentially. We call the amount of water vapor the atmosphere can contain the saturation vapor pressure. So at any given time, the atmosphere has both a vapor pressure, that's how much water vapor is in it, and a saturation vapor pressure, how much it could possibly contain. Sometimes those two numbers are exactly the same. When that happens, you have a cloud. When it doesn't happen, you're subsaturated and the air is relatively dry. Now, what I want you to see is, look over here on the right. I've got this really cool picture of these city buildings, uh, this is in Istanbul, jutting up out of the fog. What's going on in the fog? Well, in the fog, the amount of water vapor that's in the atmosphere, that is the vapor pressure, matches its saturation point. Hence, the air is saturated and the humidity level 100%. Outside of that, well, out here above, the saturation vapor pressure must be greater than the vapor pressure. In other words, what's in the air in terms of water vapor must be less than what it can contain. In that case, the relative humidity is below 100%. There is no cloud up at the top here, and the air is not saturated. You see, there's a relationship, again, between temperature and the amount of moisture the atmosphere can contain. What's ironic is, one of the places on Earth that has the highest potential for holding water vapor doesn't. That's the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert is so hot, therefore it can possibly contain an enormous amount of water vapor. But it's a desert. It doesn't. You see, we're talking about how much you can contain versus how much you actually have. Okay, that's a bit of a confusing topic. But the reason why I teach you this is because I want to get everything down to these two bullet points. What is the dew point temperature? And what is relative humidity? 
dew point temperature. It's simply this. It's the temperature to which the air must be cooled for condensation to begin. Well, when you get condensation, you might make dew. That's the picture in the upper left. Or you might make clouds, or you might make frost or fog. It's getting the water vapor to become a liquid or a solid. Now, when the temperature is close to the dew point, the air is very humid, a lot of water vapor in it. When the temperature is far from the dew point, the air is very dry. Now, the dew point temperature, if you're in a room right now watching this, okay, if you want to know what the dew point temperature is, go over to the thermostat and turn it way, 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 way down. Now, more than likely, you won't be able to turn it down far enough to get dew to form. That's because you're inside. And inside, if you've got the air conditioning on, well, you've filtered out a lot of the water vapor. It's been condensed out, and therefore the air inside your house is probably pretty dry. But the dew point temperature can be found by cooling the air until you start to see condensation happening. What did you do? You took the air temperature down to the point at which it became saturated. Now, if that term wasn't confusing enough, Relative humidity is by far the most confusing term when it comes to the basics of atmospheric sciences, and this is why. Relative humidity is relative. You see, relative humidity is a ratio. It's a ratio of the vapor pressure over the saturation vapor pressure. It is not a ratio of dew point over temperature. That's because the relationship between the two is exponential. You saw that in the previous graph. So that's why we had to teach you about vapor pressure and saturation vapor pressure. Now, when you think about this, if you want to change the relative humidity, change either the numerator or the denominator of this equation. Let me help you figure this out. Imagine I have a chunk of air, a parcel of air. And because the air temperature is what it is in this case, let's just say there are 12 spaces for water vapor molecules to occupy. Okay, This is a relatively tiny example. Now, those 12 spaces are set by the temperature, and if they're all full, it's completely saturated, and therefore we know what the saturation vapor pressure is. But they're not. Only four of the spaces are full. Therefore, the vapor pressure, which is set by the dew point, is 4. The saturation vapor pressure is 12. What's the relative humidity? 33%. I just used the equation. 4 over 12 times 100 is 33. Now, if I want to change the relative humidity, I got a few options. If I heat the air up, think about what will happen. If I heat the air up, I increase the saturation vapor pressure and therefore increase the number of spots. Therefore, heating the air up always lowers the relative humidity. What if I cool the air off? If I cool the air off, I get rid of spaces and therefore the relative humidity goes up. This is what happens almost every morning. Do you notice how there's a dew most mornings? That's because we cooled the air off overnight, therefore saturating the atmosphere, producing some dew. I could also put more water vapor into this, and sometimes we have winds that come out of the south here in the United States, right out of the Gulf of Mexico, and there's a ton of moisture in that air. And therefore, if I put more water vapor in, look, I increase the relative humidity. You see, changing relative humidity is as simple as changing the numerator or the denominator. Yet, understanding the concept is very, very hard. Let me give you some examples. I'm going to walk through this with you. Pay close attention to this. I've got four cities. Bismarck, temperature 35, dew point 34. Chicago, 55 over 45. Miami, 86 over 68. And Phoenix, 101 degrees Fahrenheit with a dew point of 59. Now, let's answer the questions together. Which city has the highest relative humidity? Now, I don't want you to do the calculation. Let's just eyeball it. Can you see how Bismarck has a dew point temperature that's closest to its temperature? Bismarck has the highest relative humidity. Now, which one has the lowest relative humidity? Well, if we just compared the two temperature, the temperature to the dew point and found the closest, well, let's look for the farthest. Clearly, that's Phoenix. Now, my next question is this. Which city has the highest saturation vapor pressure? Think about it. Got an answer? Well, the answer in this case is Phoenix. Why? Well, remember, the air's ability to contain water vapor is related to its temperature. The hotter the temperature, the higher the SVP, saturation vapor pressure. Okay? Next question. Which city has the highest vapor pressure? Well, if saturation vapor pressure is related to temperature, vapor pressure is related to dew point. And the city with the highest dew point is Miami. Now, here's the most confusing question of all of them. Which city has the highest moisture content? Think about it. 
highest moisture content, most moisture in the air. Some of you might be thinking it's Bismarck, but in reality, it's Miami. Now, why is that? Well, Bismarck, because it is so cold, it is easy to saturate. In fact, I want you to write this down or type this into your notes. Cold air is easy to saturate. Cold air is easy to saturate. Therefore, when it's cold outside, the relative humidity is almost always high. This is why you get sick in winter. Think about this. When we think about our body's defense against bacteria and viruses, we have mucus in our mouths and in our noses and our throats that's designed to trap that stuff to not let it get into our lungs to make us sick. Well, when you are in the middle of winter and the air temperature outside is really, really cold, well, outside the air is very close to saturation. The humidity may be 70, 80, even 90%. But we draw that air in through a furnace. And the furnace heats it up without adding any water vapor to it. Therefore, the air on the inside is really, really warm and really dry. Therefore, drying out our nasal passages, drying out our throats, drying out our mouths. And that weakens our defenses. Now, what's the best way to combat this? You don't want to get sick in the winter? Get a humidifier. Bring up the humidity levels in your house or your apartment. I did this when I put a new air conditioning, a new furnace in my house. I put a whole home humidifier because I have two kids. And in 2018 right now, they're five and eight years old. And it is the worst thing in the world for those two kids to be sick. So I put a whole home humidifier on it. So during the winter, our house is nice and humid and we resist getting sick because of it. Now, cold air is easy to saturate. Does this make sense? When you look at this, even though the relative humidity in Bismarck might be 97% and the relative humidity in Phoenix might be, I don't know, 15%, there is more moisture in the air in Phoenix than there is in Bismarck. It's just hot atmospheres are hard to saturate. It takes a lot of water vapor. So it's super dry in Phoenix, even though the humidity, I'm sorry, even though the moisture content's very high, the humidity is very low. My last question for you before we get off of this slide here is which city would sweating be the most efficient way to cool off? Now, you're not going to sweat in Chicago or Bismarck. It's going to be nice weather, but you're going to sweat in Phoenix or Miami. Well, it's going to be most efficient in Phoenix and least efficient in Miami. Why? Well, Phoenix, because of the low humidity, there's plenty of space in the air for the water vapor to evaporate off your skin and become, uh, you know, basically sweat floating around in the atmosphere. <laughs> Where in Miami, it's so humid because the dew point's so close to the temperature that there's not much room. That's why it's always hot and humid and disgusting in Miami, and that's why old people want to live in Phoenix. It's dry out there. It's nice and warm and dry. Okay, if you need to, review this part of the lecture, because it's a tricky one, and I'm going to ask you questions about it later. Let's talk about this. Now, I'm a homeowner, and I love to have a nice green lawn. Now, in order to keep my lawn green, I have to understand that figure that's in the top. Now, what do we have here? On the x-axis, I go from midnight to noon to midnight. And on a particular day, let's imagine my dew point temperature stays constant, doesn't change. But my temperature is lowest in the morning, right before sunrise, and highest in mid-afternoon. And then as the sun sets, it goes down. What does the relative humidity do? Well, when the temperature and dew point temperature are close together, the relative humidity is really, really high. When the temperature and dew point temperature are far apart, like you see here, well, the relative humidity is very low. When you are watering your lawn in summer, you're doing it so that your grass stays green. It doesn't get dry in parts like you see in the bottom right image. Never water your lawn in the middle of the afternoon. The low relative humidity means the water that goes on the grass evaporates right back up into the atmosphere and it's wasted. Water your lawn overnight or in the early morning hours. That it gets a better chance of the water staying in the soil so the plant can use it. So just a simple tip about watering your lawn. How about this one? Ever had your bathroom members, uh, mirrors fog up like this? How, what's the best way to get rid of that? Now, my bathroom, I could turn on a vent. It draws out the dry, uh, sorry, the humid air uh, and therefore draws in some drier air and it can evaporate this. But why in the world did water vapor condense on the mirror in the first place? Well, it did it because the mirror is cold and therefore the air right next to the mirror is cold as well. And the colder the air is, the less water vapor it can contain and the water vapor condensed onto the mirror. Now, another way you might want to get rid of it, open the door, let some drier air in. When you do that, 
Remember, our relative humidity equation is vapor pressure over saturation vapor pressure. When we let the dry air in, we're reducing the numerator and therefore lowering the ratio. Here's another way to do it, and this is a very clever way. If you have a hair dryer, blow the hair dryer on the mirror. You blow in hot air and dry air, and as a consequence, this will be removed of fog very, very quickly. Or buy a heated mirror. Heated mirrors increase the temperature, therefore increasing the saturation vapor pressure, and don't let water vapor condense upon it. These are all solutions to this. Now here's another question that's a little more applicable to everyday life. Here's the question. You're driving along. There's uh, 10 of your closest friends are packed into your tiny little car. You're all breathing. And as you breathe, the water vapor from your bodies is now starting to condense on the inside of the glass. You need to get rid of it. What do you do? Well, many of you know that you can simply turn on the dehumidifier. You can turn on the defroster. And the defroster blows air into the windshield and can evaporate that moisture that's condensed there. But here is the question. Do you blow hot air on the window? Or do you blow cold air on the window? Think about it. As you think about it, remember this equation. The equation for relative humidity is, uh, whoops, sorry there, is vapor pressure over 5 VP. No, sorry, that's just bad writing. SVP, saturation vapor pressure. So remember, what we're ultimately trying to do here is lower the relative humidity. Well, the answer, blow hot air, not cold. Hot air, higher saturation vapor pressure, dramatically lowers the relative humidity, and the fog will evaporate on the inside of the mirror. Oh, I'm sorry, the inside of the glass. Now, what if you don't have a functioning, you know, uh, defroster button? Roll down the windows. That'll also let some drier air in as well. Even if it's raining outside, roll them down. It'll let the drier air in. Now, my car, when I automatically turn on the defroster, it also turns something else on in my car, and that is the air conditioning. You see, what is air conditioning? It's the removal of water vapor from the air, therefore cooling it. So in my car, I can turn on the heat with the air conditioner, which lowers the water vapor content. This is kind of a double whammy effect on relative humidity. Blowing hot, dry air onto the windscreen gets rid of the fog on the inside. It's the same principle as turning on the hair dryer on your mirror. So this is how this all works. Now, why is all of this so important, severe weather? Well, the day I recorded this video, it was the 6th of June, and we had a uh, storm prediction center put out an area right in through here where they were worried about severe thunderstorms. Why is that? Well, out of the Gulf of Mexico on this day, really, really high humidity, high dew point temperature air was advecting, moving through the lower levels of the atmosphere up into the central plains of the United States. And high humidity air is a crucial ingredient for thunderstorm development. So I went through all of this training about water in the atmosphere so that you will remember that the high moisture content of the air is a crucial ingredient to getting massive severe thunderstorms. And we're gonna be talking about those very, very soon. So it's all about temperature, pressure, and water in the atmosphere. So keep all of these things, these basic principles in mind as we dig through all these different severe weather topics throughout the rest of the semester. So there you go. That's where we start off this semester.